It is 4 p.m. in Singapore, and I am Taimur Beg, Chief Economist of DBS Group Research, uh, welcoming you to our January live stream from Macroeconomic Insights. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to all the 400 or so listeners who, are, uh, who have registered or viewers who are watching it in their uh, iPhone or any other uh, device that you have out there. Uh, this has been an extraordinary interlude. We left you in the beginning of Je December with our annual outlook, which we title as a bifurcated world. Uh, since then, some of the bifurcations have already accentuated. Asset markets have continued to rally. There has been major political upheaval in certain parts of the world, and there are other parts of the world where it's been very, very quiet and stable. So within that narrative, uh, we will present to you a series of slides taking stock of what's been going on, and we have received some very, very good questions, and we'll address them toward the end. So let's get to the title of this presentation. We call it The Shape of 4Q20 and 1Q21. The idea is to give you a sense of how the year ended, how the first quarter of 2021 is shaping up, and then extrapolating from that a broader outlook for the whole year. And from there, we're going to go to the question of you know, asset market valuation. I can tell from the tone of the questions that have come so far that that's very much in everybody's mind. And uh, then we will take those questions and others uh, during the Q&A part toward the end. So how did 2020 end? Well, with a lot of noise, uh, we had tumultuous developments around Brexit, which sort of came to a fruition toward the end of the year. Then we had massive uncertainty around US elections, which thankfully is more or less resolved by now, but boy, oh boy, what a ride we have had. And then we have had issues related to uh, trade and investment deals, which have sort of crept up in a decisive manner, a major pushback against the global deglobalization narrative that we have had is the fact that there are actually still deals getting done and like-minded countries are still trying to come together to uh, prosper through trade and market uh, liberalization. So on the Brexit side, uh, we will not spend too much time on the UK in this live stream, but let's at least touch on Brexit, which has sort of dominated uh, Euro-related headlines for, or European-related headlines for a good two, three years. Um, uh, but uh, now, of course, you know, it sort of hopefully will be fading into the background to some extent. Um, so what did the UK get and what did the Europeans get? Well, on the rules and standards side, clearly, you know, the shared rules will stay in place. Uh, environmental regulations, there'll be convergence between the two uh, entities. Uh, there will be middle ground, more or less, on travel, fishing, and financial services. Some of those things were uh, presenting really teething problems to the very last second, but it all got worked out at the end. Uh, Northern Ireland, which also was a very big thorn in the side of this, uh, will uh, continue to follow many of the EU's rules and uh, will uh, not allow its border to harden, although there will be some checkpoints in place for goods coming in from uh, mainland uh, UK to Northern Ireland. Uh, and then the UK will be set free to set its uh, trade policy and negotiate deals with other countries. And then there will still be some issues that will be uh, outstanding. Uh, data security, phishing, financial services, all those uh, will be there uh, posing challenges as time goes by. Then there's the U.S. elections, which I don't think I need to go too much into. Everybody has been watching television, have been reading the newspapers. Um, we have a very divided country. Uh, even though Joe Biden won with a six million margin in the general election and with uh, 300 plus electoral votes, I think it is fair to say that the country is very much divided uh, and the margin of victory in various swing states was actually exceptionally narrow, just like it was in 2016. So that polarization has not changed. Uh, outgoing President Trump uh, did some really uh, astonishing things in the last month or so, repeatedly questioning the integrity of the election framework and the way votes were counted. His supporters clearly believe him, and therefore we saw the dramatic developments in the U.S. Capitol uh, yet last week, uh, spillover from which I'm sure will continue through this month, uh, discussions about impeaching Trump, uh, 
or any other uh, punitive measures against those who uh, broke through the uh, doors of the U.S. Capitol. All of those things will continue to dominate the headlines, which is a bit unfortunate because I think this is the time of the season in the elections where you normally stop worrying about the outgoing president and start focusing on the new appointments and policy agenda of the incoming president. So unfortunately, that issue will remain. But on the fortunate side, um, especially if you're a Democrat, is the fact that there are 50 Democrats in the Senate, and therefore, in terms of passing some legislation, uh, getting uh, various uh, appointments that need congressional approval through, uh, the Democrats will be able to do that uh, without any headache. Uh, but let's be very, very clear that there will remain numerous challenges to governance uh, going forward for Joe Biden and his team. Finally, on a more positive note uh, that uh, we had in the November announcement of RCEP, toward the end of December, we heard the announcement of uh, China-EU uh, uh, investment agreement. Uh, and then in the middle of all this on CPP, CPTPP, which is basically TPP minus the US, uh, developments have been taking place. Uh, in fact, uh, in our uh, Kopi Time podcast, uh, this week's podcast is about uh, the various trade initiatives and we talk with Dr. Deborah Elms uh, uh, on that. Uh, I, I welcome you to listen to that podcast where we discuss uh, the implications for businesses on RCEP, uh, what is the immediate uh, financial and business implication, uh, what was the reason for the CAI between China and EU to get finalized toward the end of December, uh, was it rushed or was it just a part of a long process? Uh, Dr. Elm sheds light on all of those things with a great deal of expertise, so I welcome you to listen to that. Um, now, the title of the session is How 2020 Ended, and it was not just about Brexit and U.S. elections and trade deals, it was largely about COVID and the financial crisis that came around it. I think in March or April, the most obvious thing to say about what was happening in the world was that the pandemic would very readily morph into a full-blown financial and economic crisis. Well, we have certainly have had an economic crisis and we're not out of the woods yet, but on the financial side, things have actually not been like that at all. There was nervousness and panic selling only for about three weeks or so, during which time the central banks of the world got to work, took very, very strong measures, and as a result, we have ample liquidity, record low interest rates around the world, which of course has led to um, a big rally in asset markets, something that we will talk about a little later. Uh, but the most important thing about taking stock about the way 2020 ended is the way banks have been a part of the solution this time, as opposed to 2008 when they were part of the problem. Uh, banks have had a much stronger balance sheet. Uh, they have had uh, significant encouragement from regulators to go out and help the recovery by taking on stakeholder responsibility. And I think it is fair to say that the banks around the world have delivered. So the chart that you have on the screen is, I think, absolutely stark in demonstrating the difference between the 08 global financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis vis-a-vis -vis the ongoing crisis. A typical crisis would lead to deleveraging, uh, banking crisis, balance sheet contraction, uh, NPLs, and so on. Uh, some of those risks are definitely there, uh, especially with respect to NPL. Maybe some of that is crisis postponed, not necessarily averted. But the fact that we spent 2020 in the middle of this once in a lifetime pandemic, banks extending credit, expanding their balance sheet across the board is absolutely remarkable and something that both policymakers and the financial sector should take some credit for. This chart shows you that the cumulative change in bank loans to GDP in the last three quarters have been positive across China, US, and Euro area, something that you would not have even imagined in the case of Euro uh, area in 2011 or US in 2008. Quarter after quarter of balance sheet contraction was the story of the day at that time, whereas in this case we have seen, particularly in China, but also in Europe and US, banking sector remaining very much engaged with their borrowers, uh, taking advantage of the various facilities and windows that the authorities have given them and remaining engaged with the society as it dealt with the pandemic. A little more on credit. Um, the issue is not just limited to you know, credit crisis averted in US, Europe, or China. There are other things going on as well. So this chart shows you that credit spreads widen sharply for a while, 
uh, and by while I really mean March, April. And after that, they start to normalize. And as we stand here in the uh, early part of January 2021, we are more or less normalized. Consider what's happening with China, US dollar credit or high yield. Uh, they're back to they were before 2019. Um, India is not 100% normal, especially with respect to high yield credit, but very, very close to it. And then if you look at Indonesia, probably has even a slightly longer path to go before normalizing, but also have had a remarkable journey in terms of spread narrowing, liquidity being available, and fundraising and refinancing taking place in a fairly unimpeded manner. So a debt crisis may well be the outcome of this pandemic, but it won't be for the sort of typical countries that we look at on a day-to-day -day basis. China, India, Indonesia, in my view, uh, would have been far more vulnerable in a typical crisis where you would have seen monetary con conditions contract, liquidity tighten. This is not a typical crisis. This is a crisis where global central banks have acted forcefully and proactively from the first day. And as a result, we see the countries that have reliance on external funding or need some degree of support from external markets for a variety of reasons, including for their own financial stability, have all seen conditions normalize in a very dramatic manner. It's not just been concentrated in the constituencies of the Fed and the ECB. Others have benefited as well. Now, life is not just about you know, credit spreads and market volatility. It's really about uh, what's happening with people's lives. Uh, and overall GDP growth and the kind of inflation that they face. So we've prepared for you here a, a sort of a sort of somewhat innovative or fresh look at what is known as a misery metric. So misery metric is, you know, if your growth is weakening and inflation is going up, some sort of a stagflationary scenario, well, you're in the worst of both worlds and that's like your most miserable state. Uh, high growth and low inflation would be the opposite of that and everything else would be in between within that spectrum of misery. Um, so what we have done is taken our numbers for 2019 and 2020 and looked at the differences. So what was the change in growth in 2020 versus 19? What was the change in inflation in 2020 versus 19? So when you look at, so for example, India, where 20 growth over 19 growth is something close to 12% uh, GDP growth, and the change in inflation is plus 3%. I mean, that is you know, almost the definition of misery. It really was a very, very tough year for India where people had to pay higher prices of food and transportation and so on, at the same time worrying very much about their livelihood and seeing um, incomes drop precipitously, especially in the first half of last year. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum were countries like Taiwan, Korea, Vietnam, China, uh, which saw growth declining relative to the previous year, but definitely stayed on positive territory for the whole year. Uh, so the negative numbers you see here are basically just saying that you know if you were six, you're down to two, it doesn't mean that you're negative two. Uh, and then you have these countries in the middle, Japan, US, Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, Eurozone, uh, sharp contraction in growth, but no inflationary issue to think of. In fact, all of those countries saw disinflation as an in inflation was lower in 2020 relative to 2019. So. India, Philippines, Malaysia, in our view, were the thir three worst performing economies in our sample. Taiwan, Korea, Vietnam, China would be at the other end of the spectrum. Um, now, Asia is, of course, very trade oriented. So what happened with trade is also important for us to track in terms of assessing how 2020 panned out. And what you see in the chart now is the A EM Asia, and we sort of take the aggregate by using PPP weights, and, and what has been happening with respect to exports through the course of last year? Well, very severe contraction, anticipated by the PMIs very, very well. As you can see, there's a strong lead lag relationship between the two variables. Um, but then, of course, you know, uh, business managers began to turn positive fairly quickly. And PMI was basically by heading toward 50, again, aggregate basis for the whole region. Uh, by the middle of last year, by July, and since then it's gone strength to strength. And right now, our regional aggregate PPP weighted PMI is hovering around 54, and exports have followed suit. And for the region as a whole, through the month of November, exports were up about 16% on a year-on-year -year basis. So terrific numbers um, coming out of Asia, acting as a very, very good tailwind uh, going into 2021. Now. Some countries have seen exports pick up, some countries have seen sales pick up, domestic demand doing well. Uh, so let's look at two economies where the 2020 recovery had very different trajectory. So in this chart, we have 
the blue lines denoting the US and red lines denoting China. And what you see is that China, of course, was in the eye of the storm at the very beginning of 2020 and saw a massive decline in production and retail sales, but then of course began to recover and all through the course of 2020 gone, went strength to strength. What is interesting is that China initially had a robust export recovery with rather anemic pickup in uh, re retail sales, which remained in negative territory till the third quarter. Uh, but after that, uh, the both series are showing quite a bit of strength. As you can see, they're more or less converged now. Uh, exports are up about 78%, retail sales are up about 5% on a year-on-year -year basis. Again, good platform for 2020. Now look at the contrast with the US where exports have uh, done very little and as a result, industrial production has been lackluster. But on the other hand, because of the government support programs, retail sales have come back with a vengeance and they're growing very fast. Now, a few months ago, for us, it was a contrast that U.S. domestic demand was far stronger than China's, whereas China's external demand was far stronger than the U.S., and therefore you saw a stronger production number in China vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Well, things are not quite the same anymore. Uh, the industrial production of China remains far stronger than the U.S., but on retail sales basis, which, in which the U.S. was outperforming China for a while, the two countries have caught up. So China certainly has had a, a pretty spectacular recovery from the depths of this pandemic. Final slide on how 2020 ended is uh, sort of stock taking on financial conditions and what's happening with economic surprise. Um, so again, the heroic intervention by the Fed and the ECB and other major monetary authorities in the world definitely helped tremendously. And financial conditions after worsening for a while uh, have come roaring back, uh, are now as easy as they were uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everything is hunky-dory. On the economic surprise side, as you can see, uh, after a pretty impressive rebound early summer uh, between election-related uncertainty, resurgence of the pandemic, uh, things have waned in the U.S. and the data surprises are few and far between. China, you can't really say it's weaker than the U.S. It's just not been as exuberant in the U.S. It's been sort of pursuing a middle course in the middle of last year, but broadly speaking, still providing some uh, steady uh, surprises on the positive side. And then there's Eurozone, which right now uh, is also again going through the worst of the pandemic, but has had a slightly better economic data on the margin compared to the U.S. So that's a you know, rather detailed way of looking at uh, how the uh, year has panned out. So now let's start looking forward, uh, the next section, shape of Q1. And we will look at the shape of Q1, not just from economics, but also from financial markets, as well as from the pandemic. So speaking of the pandemic, the first chart, and those of you who watch the live stream on a regular basis will be very familiar with these analytics that we have. Total number of confirmed cases versus new cases. It tells you both the stock and the flow of the disease uh, over time. And what you see here is the US is just extraordinarily um, uh, deep into the pandemic, uh, has you know, close to, I think, 23 million cases as of today. Uh, and uh, you know, every five days now adding about a million people that are testing positive. So 150 to 200,000 per day, that's the sort of numbers we're seeing. And because those numbers are so large, you know, by extension, you will see suffering, both in terms of serious illness and fatality also pick up. I'll, I'll talk about fatality momentarily at a different set of analytics. Uh, but uh, who else is in trouble beyond the US? Well, Brazil has been lockstep with the US for a while. Looks like it's getting a little better. Uh, then you have countries like Russia, where things got better for a while. Now again, have started to worsen. Uh, and then we have a bunch of cases of this V and W shaped uh, out, uh, outturn, uh, whether you think about Spain or Italy, uh, Germany, all of those cases, you know, things have gotten a bit dicey, a bit complicated uh, since then. Um, and uh, I don't have Sweden for some reason on this chart, but in Sweden also we have seen a similar resurgence. And of course, it's an important country to follow because they have, of course, had a very different model of dealing with the pandemic. Same analytics, but now we see it in the context of um, Asian economies, uh, and uh, the you know good stories are of course the usual good stories. You know China did a very good job of managing the pandemic early on, and has very very few cases these days. Uh, Singapore has had a terrific recovery from uh, you know poor start, 
uh, but in the last four or five months uh, have been able to bring down local infection cases to zero to one a day, uh, and hence you see this such a large drop in that uh, orange or pinkish line. Uh, speaking of pinkish line, uh, South Korea is a more prominent pink in this thing, and there th we've seen a bit of a resurgence in recent months, uh, and which is causing some degree of anxiety. We've seen some stories out of Japan. Uh, but within Asia, the countries that are showing still a fairly sharp increase in terms of daily infection rates, well, one would be Indonesia, and we don't think Philippines is out of the woods, although we do see a s worst maybe behind us. Uh, but when you look at countries that have had very strong success in pandemic management and still see V or W shape infection rate numbers, uh, it just tells you how difficult it is to contain COVID-19 uh, and vi the vaccine cannot come soon enough. So I said that earlier, I was gonna talk about fatalities just beyond the issue of um, infection rate. And it's important because you see hear from a lot of people that well, it doesn't really matter how many people are testing positive anymore because we know how to deal with patients and therefore fatality rate is going down sharply. Well, not quite. If you have millions and millions of people testing positive, death rate may be low, but the number of death, just pure number of death or per capita, it doesn't matter which way you scale it, will be going up substantially. Observe this chart from April onward, after the really, really confusing, difficult times of uh, spring of 2020, uh, as the weather started to get warmer, um, you know, most countries in Asia, I suppose, with the ex or in the world, uh, with the exception of Brazil, uh, managed to bring down the fatality rate substantially. But then people started relaxing and going out and attending Trump's rallies and uh, doing uh, all sorts of uh, things, uh, no, probably not being very, very responsible and not wearing masks or observing social distancing. And as a result, now, after the holiday season in the US, we're seeing serious spike in infection rates and by extension, serious pickup in death rates. Look at this chart and how extraordinary the numbers are right now. And by the way, these are not stock numbers, right? These are monthly numbers, flow. So every single month is a new set of data points. So the US in December of this year had something like you know, 225,000 deaths per million. Uh, and then you go to a country like UK, you see Sweden here, uh, you see the US. Uh, these are again extraordinary numbers between 100 and 250 deaths per million per month. Uh, and then again, picked up a lot. And given the amount of travel people did during the holiday seasons, I fear that when the January numbers settle, we will see further worsening of this chart. Uh, of course, you know, we are sort of hopeful that between vaccination and development of therapeutics and better knowledge of how to deal with COVID-19 patients, that we will be able to reduce suffering. We will be able to reduce uh, deaths uh, significantly uh, but we're not quite there yet, and despite knowing a lot more about the disease today than we did seven, eight months ago, we are still seeing a flare-up in fatalities around many, many countries in the world. Interesting uh, data point on this chart is, of course, India, which has some of the highest number of cases in the world, but at least reported data is suggesting that the fatality rate is exceptionally low. Uh, so take the data with a grain of salt. There is some controversy around the veracity of the data, but if it's official, we just go with it, and it's kind of showing that India has virtually you know, sort of no more than 10, 20 uh, deaths per million, which is about a 10th or a 15th lower than the case of the US or the UK. Okay, moving from the pandemic to the economic momentum question, you know, the shape of Q1. Uh, so this is Atlanta Fed's um, GDP now cast, which shows that the economy lost some momentum in the fourth quarter. And in recent weeks, it has been sort of steadily downgrading its outlook for the US economy. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, when you think about uh, some degree of slowdown, well, in the case of China, that's not really the case. Uh, their PMI suggests that things have been not spectacular, but you know, fairly strong through the course of the second half of 2020 and spilling into 2021. Uh, Baltic dry freight index, which in our view is a very useful indicator of what's happening with global sh shipping, and uh, it's also showing some signs of life uh, beginning to pick up, trying to incorporate some of the upside stories out there. The um, next thing that we need to sort of think about is, you know, when you talk about shape of Q1, how will GDP pan out in the first quarter uh, of this year uh, now that we have pretty good sense of how the third quarter panned out? So that's where our now casting framework comes in. And what I'm going to do now is walk you through eight slides, uh, two per country. So I'll be going over four countries and share with you our 
insights um, analysis on uh, how these economies are doing on a real-time basis. So, so we're starting with China, and as you can see here, I don't have raw numbers. To make the numbers comparable, I have what we call z-scores, the function of the mean and the standard deviation of any data series. All that you need to take away from this chart is that in the case of China, IP, which is industrial production, FAI, which is fixed asset investment, and loans, which is loans, uh, have shown some degree of divergence. We haven't seen much strength in fixed asset investment, but fairly remarkable strength in FAI and IP toward the end of 2020, which is going to hold the 2021, early 2021 outlook in good stead. And on the external side, China has done very well, and you can see it in the second panel of this chart, um, that whether it is exports, not all imports, or retail sales, things have been picking up very, very sharply in China. Putting all this together, we create what we call China's GDP nowcast. So not only are we able to, using this approach to produce an estimate for the outgoing or the, the previous quarter for which GDP data is still not available, but we can also make a call, if you will, for the first quarter. And what we see here is, again, um, strength to strength for the Chinese economy. Uh, for the uh, October, November, December quarter, growth will head toward 6.5%. And by the time the Q1 data becomes available to us in a few months' time, uh, we will see China reporting something in the range of 11.5% growth on a year-on-year -year basis. Now, granted, there's a very strong base effect because the economy shrank sharply uh, four quarters ago. But on a sequential basis also, I think it is abandonedly clear that production, shopping, so on, are, are very much back on in China. Moving on. Uh, we look at India's now cast, uh, and for which we have collected you know, six key variables, production, trade, investment, sales, credit, and government expenditure. So what do we see there? Uh, again, a very sharp V, um, almost uh, mimicking the sort of movement that we saw in the case of China. Uh, so very strong pickup in exports from a low base, admittedly, uh, strong pickup in industrial production, and public spending is also ratcheting up. So that's all sort of good news for India, which has had a very torrid 2020 with respect to low growth and high inflation. Similarly, you move on to other indicators of growth like sales, credit, and government expenditure. Uh, you see a sharp decline and adjustment in the first quarter of 2020, following which there's been some steady improvement. Although in this chart, which is a different way of looking at the same data earlier, uh, credit has been somewhat lackluster. Putting all that together, what we see is India uh, on track to register positive growth rate in the first quarter of 2021, uh, but although October, December would still be in negative territory in our view. But if you sort of follow the news flow of India, you can tell that things are turning, that foreign direct investment remains substantial, uh, the um, enthusiasm of global investors, uh, both on the portfolio asset market of India as well as on FDI, remains uh, very, very high. Uh, and therefore, although this now cast is not painting a very convincing picture for India, showing only about 0% growth through the first quarter of 2021, it seems to me that the global investors are not that interested in this day-to-day -day fluctuation in GDP calls or uh, estimates. Uh, they're looking at a broader picture, hoping that India will deliver big returns over time, and hence um, the, the uh, interest, sustained interest. So anyway, uh, in the case of India, again, as we have said, we will struggle to go past 0% growth through the first quarter of 2021. Then there is Indonesia, very keen to impress global investors about the worthiness of investing in their country, uh, coming up with reform measure after reform measure, on paper at least, uh, to again uh, generate investor enthusiasm. But what about real data? Well, we see that capacity utilization has picked up. Uh, and the consumer confidence index is also doing kind of well. And uh, so from that perspective, you know, there is some hope. But uh, consumer confidence, which also had taken a big hit, has begun to recover. And then in the case of car sales, uh, cement sales, visitor arrivals, um, it's a very mixed bag. Tourism is still deeply, deeply uh, dysfunctional and hardly anybody is going to Indonesia. But as far as car, car sales are concerned, motorcycle sales are concerned, things have begun to pick up. And I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that construction, cement sales as a proxy for that, after contracting sharply, perhaps is beginning to show some degree of sequential strength. 
putting all that together, and what you get for Indonesia is, again, a uh, negative growth rate for the October-December quarter. But after that, positive growth for the new year, something in the range of 2%. All right, so we've looked at China, India, and Indonesia. What lies ahead for Singapore? Well, Singapore has had a very difficult year. Uh, it's a small open economy, a very big beta to the movement of global goods and services, and once everything came to a standstill, tourists stopped coming, business travel stopped. Singapore, of course, had to go through a deep economic contraction. Now, when you look at these high-frequency indicators, these are monthly data, by the way. Only the now cast estimate itself is a quarterly uh, frequency variable. Everything else here is on a monthly basis. So you do see re-exports turn positive. You do see that residential transactions have begun to perk up. Uh, retail sales have picked up because Singaporeans are not traveling, so they're staying at home and going to the malls and buying lots and lots of stuff. That's all good. may not be sufficient to turn the economic trajectory around in a very meaningful manner, but certainly helps, does not hurt. Uh, our nowcast is not seeing growth turning positive in the first quarter of this year. That is something more reserved for the second quarter, uh, although we do think that um, there could be policy measures coming through the pipeline that could sort of, you know, help growth pick up in the near term. Uh, we have no knowledge about that, but it's just a hunch that uh, the lackluster trajectory of the economy might prompt some more support from the authorities. So far, you know, we just keep our fingers crossed. So that, in a nutshell, is a now casting estimate of uh, four key Asian countries. I'm now going to move on to a few other things that are going to be sort of fairly important um, touch points for the first quarter of 2021. Issue number one is inflation expectations, and we have many questions in the Q&A session on this. Uh, yes, expectations have recovered, quite a bit, in fact. Uh, this is basically latest data available, and U.S. inflation expectations based on five-year forward, five-year inflation swap is now over 2%. Eurozone is nowhere close to that, but it's at 1.3, which is not that far away from where it was a couple of years ago. I think the spider chart on the right-hand side of the panel is usefully illustrative about you know, the breakdown in the, um, or the, the 10 year break-even, which is based on the difference between 10-year bond yield and 10-year inflation protected bond yield. Uh, in there, things have again picked up. Uh, I think the only exception in the chart that you're looking at is the UK, but in everywhere else, between June and January, uh, June 2020 and January 2021, the um, break-evens have gone up substantially uh, across the board. With again, UK being the expect exception. So everywhere where we used to be and where we are now is suggesting that inflation is on the horizon. It may be coming. Realized inflation may be absolutely inconsequential, may not lead to a big run on goods in anywhere, but uh, be, beware, I think, uh, is the, of the trend is, is what we are going to take away from this. Uh, it's not just a question of inflation expectations turning around. There's also been a bit of a commodity rally or commodity rebound. Uh, gold all through 2020 st performed st very strongly and has gone strength to strength. But if you look at industrial metals, metals like copper, it, after having a torrid year in 19 and much of early part of 2020, turned positive and it's looking pretty good. Oil, which suffered a lot, uh, is also beginning to come back. And now you compare that with uh, CRB's measure for industrial metals, food, and Brent oil, uh, the overall trajectory becomes even more clear and stark that we are seeing a steady rise in the commodity reflation narrative uh, led by China, I'm sure, but also held by various things that are happening elsewhere in the world. So if you have inflation expectations going up and you have commodity prices going up, well, you're bound to have some degree of tightening of the yield curve, which is here calculated as a difference between 10-year and two-year uh, bond rate in the US. And what you see there is that yield curve actually had turned negative at one point in 2019, expecting a recession within the year in the US. So a little that the participants in that trade know that uh, the things are going to change very dramatically and curves will actually start to steepen subsequently. So all of the work that the global central banks have done at the narrow end of the spectrum, keeping rates down, well, they have not completely changed the narrative. And now, lately, we're again beginning to see that the 10-year, two-year spread beginning to widen um, or else, you know, there would be issues. <clears throat> so having covered the 
shape of Q1, which again is characterized by some degree of reflation, some degree of yield curve steepening, strong momentum from China, and maybe some ray of hope for the Singapore, Indias, Indonesias, who will probably begin to sort of put out uh, slightly positive or somewhat more than slightly positive uh, growth numbers uh, in the coming quarters. So let's now move to the outlook for the rest of the year. Um, so when we think about outlook, given that, you know, again, we are just a week away from uh, Joseph Biden's inauguration, let's begin by talking about Biden's agenda, which, mind you, will have ripple effects worldwide in also in the back of our neighborhood in Asia. So Mr. Biden's key agenda and key policy priorities are very easy to sense out. I think that's what he has been running on through his campaign, and that really is the imperative for the country at this juncture. So how to manage the pandemic? What kind of fiscal stimulus to uh, give to the society beyond the $600 check that President Trump approved a couple of weeks ago? I mean, how does one sort of, you know, take taxpayers' money and use it better? Uh, Re-engagement with allies, something which the Trump administration was not at all interested in. Uh, Donald Trump picked fights on fairly middle-of-the-road issues uh, with Japan, with South Korea, with Germany, and so on. Uh, we don't think you know, that will be the modus operandi of the Biden administration. They will want to re-engage with their uh, allies. And in that process also rejoin multilateralism, so all this you know, withdrawal or um, uh, obstruction of judges getting appointed in the WTO. I think that'll be more of a yesteryear, Trump year phenomenon than anything that's going to happen under the Obama year. Uh, and of course, the legacy of the Trump presidency is such that uh, Joe Biden simply cannot you know, wish away the China problem, and it is indeed a problem from the U.S. perspective. Uh, so how he and his team deal with China would be interesting to watch, but of course it will be a very big priority for the government. And then this um, notion of, you know, now that the Democrats are in power, uh, should they go for some big tech regulation, something that the Republicans were sort of converging toward uh, last year, but they haven't really followed through uh, with a few exceptions here and there, but it may well become a central theme of the Biden administration. Then there is a fiscal focus. So once you sort of, you know, think, agreed that, you know, you want to write another big check to the people of America to recover faltering demand, well, how are you going to finance it and what exactly are you going to spend? So it is clear from Biden's rhetoric that there is a set of talks taking place to increase taxes on the wealthy, something that Donald Trump brought down and has probably led to a significant dent on the IRS's revenue. Um, the next issue is state aid. Again, under Trump administration, there's been some tension between the federal government and the states. Uh, trust has been um, you know, nearly invisible. A lot of vitriolic exchanges. I think Joe Biden can cause a fresh start to take place, and that will certainly help. Now, uh, the, beyond the issue of state aid, uh, the issue is of you know, how to spend the money that you are raising. You can spend some of it uh, by giving to the states, which may then help agriculture or local infrastructure, but I think the federal government, with its sort of hard-earned revenue or hard-collected revenue, if you will, need to spend money on green infrastructure, reinforce Obamacare, which is healthcare for all in the U.S., and of course the education sector, which in this COVID world certainly needs more broadband, more connective equipment, and so on. Now, earlier I showed you the misery chart, you know, looking at the change in growth and change in inflation, 19 versus 18. Well, now let's look at the forward part. Um, the 21 growth minus 20 growth and 21 projected inflation minus 21, 20 uh, inflation. So the countries that were really, really bad, India, Philippines, Malaysia, will actually look the best. They will have a growth rebound. In the case of Malaysia, however, inflation is not coming down, but in the case of India, at least, good outturn. You want to be at the bottom end of the quadrant here. Uh, strong growth pickup and uh, some degree of disinflation as base effects from high food prices fade. Uh, then you have countries like Taiwan, Korea, Vietnam, China. Uh, their growth did not suffer that much to begin with, so therefore they will grow fairly quickly again, uh, not at 6-7% rate, but re respectable rates. And then in the middle we have countries like, you know, Thailand, Singapore, Eurozone, US, Japan, where, you know, there wasn't a massive uh, unleashing of prosperity. There wasn't complete you know, despair for U.S. businesses. The authorities have tried to find sort of a middle ground in that area as well. Um, so then uh, we move on 
to this notion that um, uh, growth in the region overall you know, will be very robust this year? Well, the answer is yes, and this is a sort of summary of all our forecasts. And what you can see that for 2021, most countries will present very impressive looking numbers. Uh, and of course, the ones that had the worst performance at 20 will see better numbers in 21. But I hasten to add, and I think this is a point that I've made in previous live streams, is that there's a big difference between rebound and recovery. Uh, rebound is inevitable in 2021, but for GDP level to go back to where they were before um, the pandemic hit, I think it's, it's not gonna happen in 2021 for most countries. Most countries will have to wait till 22, if not 23, before the, the lost years from the pandemic begin to fade away. So let's just focus on the third column here, 21 forecast. China, we're looking at about 7% growth. You heard me say earlier that the now casting model is looking at 11.5% growth in the first quarter, but that's to deal with um, base effect. But beyond that, you know, things are still uh, looking pretty healthy. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the Philippines, India's, Indonesia's of the world having exp experienced big shrinkages in the past year, we'll see a robust expansion. Classic case in point is not even those three, but Malaysia, which contracted by about 7% in 2020 and would probably expand by 6% in 2021. All right, um, so, so far we have sort of touched on the way 2020 ended, uh, how 2021 first quarter is shaping up, and now we just sort of described my house and how we live there and then sort of all those. But beyond that, now the question is, you know, what is going on with asset markets? Uh, so having taken stock of growth, which is re likely to rebound in 2021, we need to also take a note of the fact that asset markets have already rebounded and gone even at higher levels than they were in 2020. What I want to show you here is a focus on the U.S. stock market performance over you know, the last 30 years or so. So let me explain what this chart is doing. So in the horizontal axis, what we have is Yale Professor Nobel Laureate Robert Schiller's estimate of cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio of the S&P 500. And on the vertical axis we have is a very interesting way of looking at this. The next 10 years, so if I am looking at this year's PE, how will the market deliver in terms of returns over the next 10 years per year? So I know the PE today, uh, or rather I know the PE from 10 years ago, I chart it against the subsequent 10 years worth of average return. So if you plot this over the last 30, 40 years, what you see is a remarkably tight relationship. As you can see, the R squared here is almost 90%. Uh, so just those two variables, um, the, or, or you know, just juxtaposing Schiller Cape with next 10 years return, give you a very, very good fit. And the point that I've highlighted, the 33.5 or so of PE and 3.42% is the latest data. So what is it telling us? It's telling us that the market is not at its frothiest. We have had many other instances when CAPE was higher. Uh, we have had instances when CAPE was in 40s. But the more important part is that this 33.5 case Schiller PE is associated with the next 10 years average return of just 3.4%. So it's not like you know sitting here, if you expect Schiller's PE to be a good indicator of how the markets will behave in the next 10 years, well, you're looking at fairly anemic performance. You wouldn't be able to draw similar charts for Asia. Asian markets are not that frothy. The PEs are not that high. Uh, but in the case of the US, the world's largest equity market, the biggest bellwether for equity market sentiments worldwide, uh, it is gonna be difficult to find very uh, high return from the index uh, over the next decade, given where valuations stand. Now, there's a caveat to this rather alarming prognosis, which is this. Yes, CAPE is high, but relative to what? Uh, CAPE is not high relative to where, you know, we are sort of what kind of return we're getting from alternative assets. So when you think about excess CAPE yield, it's a concept that Robert Schiller introduced last year. All that is is the inverse of the PE, which is the yield from the equity market, and you take the difference between that and the 10-year real interest rate. Uh, then you see that, you know, the excess CAPE yield, again, difference between the inverse of CAPE and 10-year real rate is close to 
Um, so I'm getting zero in my bond market investment. So if the equity market is giving me about 4%, that's a 4% net pickup over investing in bonds, regardless of how expensive the market is. I guess I will take it. As you can see, from 1980 to 2020, 4% uh, excess yield is not a very common phenomenon. If you get it, you take it, I suppose. It's definitely way better than it was during the dot-com era, or it was during the uh, uh, course of 2018, 2019. So that's the issue. Markets are expensive, yes. But if you want any yield, you have no choice but to ex embrace those fairly expensive assets. That, to me, is the sobering takeaway for now and for the coming years, where, again, the stock market will not replicate the performance of the last 10 years, but it will probably stay very highly valued and continue to, re continue to re receive a lot of inflows because people have nowhere else to go. Now, speaking of nowhere else to go, there is one place you can go if you don't like equities and if you don't like bonds, which is the property market. So let's take stock of what's happening with asset prices and residential prices in the region. Uh, we live in Singapore. Uh, there have been some headlines in recent months about the property market beginning to show some signs of life. And we did get some decent data out of the fourth quarter uh, prices on a Q and Q. Uh, Quarterly prices on a year-on-year -year basis is now basically you know, flattening. Uh, we had a big correction cycle in 2016-17. There was some recovery which got undermined by COVID, but I think we are, again, in the wars behind us. Low rates and ample liquidity is supporting real estate prices in Singapore for the month of 2020, a year of 2021 in our view. What about the rest of Asia? Well, China is still going strength to strength. There hasn't really been major corrections. In the case of China, I guess correction is when the market is flat, not when prices are going down. Uh, so over the last five years or so, there's been sort of steady increase in prices. And this is something that is important when one thinks about Chinese credit, that as long as you have some degree of wealth creation and wealth effect happening out of the property market, intermediation, credit risk, ability to raise funds, all of those things will continue. And given how the Chinese economy is behaving, I think we can expect to see a decent set of numbers out of Chinese property markets in 2021 as well. Unless, of course, you know, there were to be some manifestation of systemic risk, pandemic setback, or major you know, tension with the US or something like that. But beyond that, uh, it's uh, largely speaking uh, you know, fairly lackluster. So outside of China, we can think of countries like Thailand and Hong Kong um, you know, haven't really gone anywhere. Uh, South Korea has been showing some degree of pickup along with their track record of successful pandemic management. Uh, Philippines has had a you know, pretty blockbuster year followed by some flattening during the COVID moments. Uh, and then we have cases like Malaysia and Indonesia, again, you know, not really done much in the last few years. So from a property market perspective, things are not a bit like the 2007 crisis. We don't have massive fraud. We don't have issues related to structured products. We don't have concentration risk. Here in Asia, we certainly don't have any sign of bubbles or runaway prices on the asset side and the equity side also. The PEs in Asia are, of course, far more modest than the stuff you see in the tech indices and elsewhere uh, in, the, in the West. I will now uh, come toward the end of this presentation and go to the Q&A section. Uh, as I said earlier, that there are many, many questions. And I have so many on the screen that if you're looking at the slide, you will not be able to sort of decipher too much of them. So we'll take that off the screen and I'll come to you face to face. And what I'll do is uh, take some of those questions. Uh, to those of you who are actually on the registration page of the live stream, you can actually download the entire presentation and look at the questions if you'd want. Um, so of the 16 or so questions that I have, I think six or seven of them are related to crypto assets. So I'll keep that aside for a second and talk about the others and come down to digital currency and cryptos uh, momentarily. So the first question is on currencies. You know, what is the outlook for the U.S. dollar? Will the demand for the U.S. dollar from developing nations be able to offset the increased supply? The answer is yes. There is a dearth of safe assets in the world. And this is something that has been the characteristic of global financial markets for a very, very long time, decades. And because there is a glut of savings in the world and dearth of safe assets in the world, you will see countries like the US, even if they have huge amount of money printing, huge amount of debt insurance, find eager buyers. Whether they're US asset managers or sovereign wealth funds in China or Japan or the elsewhere, where will they park their money? The world is 
revolving around trade based on US dollar. Uh, we fly, our flight to safety when we're nervous about global developments is in US dollar denominated assets and US treasuries in extreme events. So therefore, even in March of last year, when the pandemic hit the US, the first thing that happened was the US dollar appreciated and US bonds rallied. So similarly, I think going forward, uh, unless uh, we saw major alternative assets come to the shore or we see a huge decline in savings and surplus uh, savings go away, till that point, we will see demand for US assets uh, remain undiminished and that includes US dollar denominated fixed income assets, which offer next to nothing yield. US dollar itself is weak. Despite that, you will still see fairly uh, robust demand for uh, US assets in my view. Second question is, are expectations of 2% inflation rate overdone given the current slack in the US economy considering current employment, unemployment levels? So I think we should provide some context to this question. This question is about the very recent uh, reflation trade that is taking place in the market. So I showed you a few charts earlier where inflation expectations have picked up, yield curve has steepened. These are all very recent phenomena, uh, phenomena I, mean, I would say two to three weeks in the making. And the reason we're seeing them is because again, the market is beginning to price in uh, factors that are beyond what is uh, alluded to in this question. Read the question. Are expectations of 2% inflation rate overdone given the current slack in the US economy? Yes, the US economy has a lot of slack, but at the same time, it's a bifurcated world. There are some sectors with lots of slack, some sectors with no slack whatsoever. So the areas with slack could probably see lackluster prices, areas where things are tightening up, you could see inflation coming up readily. Consider the following. Independent of the success of vaccination, the very fact that you as a vaccinated patient could still be a source of risk for COVID spreading means that you would have to wear a mask in the foreseeable future even after vaccination. Therefore, uh, social distancing, uh, some degree of curtailed supply with respect to airlines and hotels uh, will continue. And as a result, those areas, prices will probably go up. Uh, people are moving to the suburbs, they're buying more and more property there, they want to stay away from the cities, that'll lead to ho home price inflation. And as they move into the suburban homes and start doing home improvement, you will see uh, furniture and drills and home related material, all of those things go up in prices. So I think conditions are set for a temporary pickup in inflation, particularly with respect to energy. Uh, where I think you know, supply is going to be constrained going forward as shale producers curb their investments uh, to build more shale rigs or Saudi Arabia scales back supply as they announced last week. And as a result, we might see some energy inflation. And as I explained earlier with respect to home improvement and so on, we might see some goods price inflation. And because of the supply constraint that is likely to persist in the services industry, uh, hospitality, T tourism, travel, we might see some inflation there as well. So it's, it's one of those things where the crisis has led to some degree of cutback in investment and supply, which will then materialize in inflation because demand will start picking up as we begin to normalize and supply will struggle to keep pace. Eventually, the long-term structural forces will catch up. So therefore, I think that this inflation narrative that we are sort of getting increasingly obsessed over, and my colleague Eugene Leo published a piece on this earlier today, I welcome you to uh, look at it. Um, I think it's a temporary phenomenon. Uh, so yes, inflation is in the horizon, but not for too long. So don't start you know, uh, giving up on bonds for a permanent basis, but in the near term, you know, there are some uh, strategies uh, around likely steepening of curves and so on. Okay, so now I will read out a series of questions related to crypto. Just consider, look at these questions. One is about DBS's digital exchange, and if you combine that with MS tightening regulation on crypto business, recent rise of Bitcoin price propelled by institutional investment, are these signs that unofficially the digital currency is now getting official recognition? Good question. Second question, almost every cryptocurrency is on the rise. Any insight or factor that showed that corporates will not start, will or will not start uh, to use crypto in corporate finance. I guess this question is one day old because overnight we saw some correction in crypto prices. Is there a bubble in Bitcoin and Ethereum or is this just the beginning as they gain acceptance from more institutional investors? What's your take on the recent crypto correction? I guess this came in today. Um, so let's sort of 
address all of these questions in totality. Uh, you may know that in DBS, uh, we have this digital exchange and complementing that from group research side, we have a quarterly publication on digital currencies. Several of my colleagues uh, have been working on it uh, diligently and they published a, a, a big report last year uh, and now we have quarterly updates around that as well. The main point around crypto is the following. Uh, Bitcoin is basically the only currency in town as far as volume and scale and uh, you know transactions. The, all the other currencies sort of fall behind. So when we talk about crypto, let's just talk about Bitcoin, which of course has gone through a spectacular recovery over the last uh, 10 months or so. I think return about three times of 3x through the course of 2020 and also has gone up a lot till the correction that hit uh, l last night. Uh, so beyond that, uh, what can we say about crypto? Yes, some institutional investors are investing in crypto, which was not the case in the previous crypto run-up. Uh, there are some companies like MicroStrategy that I've been reading about, which is also devoting a large chunk of the treasury to Bitcoin. Still very fledgling initiative. Most companies will not touch that, but certainly it is a bit different than it was uh, three years ago when it was a retail phenomenon. Now certainly there's some institutional phenomenon. So we don't have any view on the price of crypto. We don't have any view on how good or how bad it is, but we do recognize that it, this, its usage, both as a store of value, primarily as a store of value, has gone up considerably. Um, next issue is related to the stock market. Stock market performance is running ahead of the economic recovery. It looks like a bubble is growing. What is your opinion in this condition? I think the slides I showed just a little while ago about the K Shiller PE and the implied return out of that and how that looks relative to fixed income return should be a useful set of insights for anybody who's worried about that question. Because the answer to the question is, I don't know about a bubble, but I certainly see pri asset prices being highly valued, but the high valuation is there uh, relative to, again, very highly valued bonds, and therefore the yield out of equity still is fairly attractive. Question on um, gold. Is gold a good choice of personal investment in 2021? So I think through the course of 2020, there were a class of investors who were very displeased with the amount of money that was being printed, the big pickup in global debt uh, uh, that was taking place, and the view was this was going to lead to a debasement of currency, and as an alternative, one should then look at gold or crypto as a hedge. Uh, th these are you know, age-old arguments. People have always sort of you know, flocked towards store of value. Uh, that have limited supply uh, when they got worried about impending inflation or money printing and so on. Uh, like I said, I'm not very bearish on inflation outlook. I see some inflation in the near term, but I don't think we have years and years of inflation ahead of us, which sort of makes probably owning gold or crypto more of a tactical bet as opposed to a structural bet. I think a lot of people are out there thinking that these are more structural issues. I probably am in the more of a cyclical camp. I would probably encourage you to dabble into these things for the cycle, but not for the rest of your investment horizon. Um, will RCEP yield any near-term benefit to Asia's firms? The answer is yes. And again, I urge you to listen to the podcast that we just released, Copy Time, and it was our episode 40 with Dr. Deborah Elms, where we talk about uh, how uh, RCEP is going to have meaningful positive impact on Asian businesses in the near term and how we might actually be surprised by the pace with which RCEP gets ratified around the region and therefore businesses should start preparing for RCEP now uh, because in the next 12 months major developments are coming. I'm sort of running out of time so I'll just take one question perhaps. Um, what is the future and implication for China-EU relationship? Um, and there, I think the major point is that this investment deal that the Europeans and the Chinese signed at the end of December uh, is something that the Europeans felt was the best that they can get out of China. Uh, and this deal certainly helps countries like Germany, which have very strong trade relationship with China. Uh, this doesn't mean that they're trying to sort of, you know, get something done to undermine uh, incoming President Biden. It's just, you know, from their own interest, it made sense to do this deal. They will, I'm sure, join the U.S. in forming a broader coalition of countries that want to bring China to a level playing field. I think those things are not gonna go away. But at the same time, I think for Europe's own interest, this uh, CAI deal that got public, uh, uh, sort of you know, inked and signed on the 30th of December has uh, some profound implications uh, in any case.
Uh, there were many other questions. I apologize not being able to take all of them. We have run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we thank all of you for uh, joining us in the year's first uh, macro li live stream. It feels great to do it live. This is the first time I've done it from a studio in nine months. Uh, and, and thanks to my colleagues in GSMC who are sitting on the other side of the camera. Uh, we will come back to you again next month uh, and perhaps we can start bringing our colleagues to this call as well as we get uh, more and more confidence in dealing with coming back to the office and, and managing this, uh, our work life around the COVID pandemic. So thanks very much. We'll see you next month.